Welcome all to this webinar uh, about uh, DOIs for research software, increasing visibility, connectivity, and citability. We have a great uh, lineup of speakers. Um, first, we'll hear from uh, Moran Grumpeter from uh, Software Heritage. Um, then I'll give a short presentation on behalf of DataSite. Um, Lars Hall Nielsen from CERN will continue. And last but not least, we'll have Stefan Buskat from uh, DLR, the German Aerospace Center. And um, afterwards, we'll have time for uh, questions and answers. So without any delay, I'll give um, the word to Moran um, and I'll stop my sharing so that you can share your slides. You are on mute, Moran. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. I just, uh, uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Thank you, everyone. And I'm very excited to be here. And thank you, Gabby, for giving me the hand. And also thank you to the data side team for inviting me to this webinar presenting software as a first class output in the scholarly ecosystem. My name is Moran Greenpeter. I work for the Software Heritage team at the INRIA Research Center in France. I'm a software engineer, but I'm also a metadata specialist and I project manage the effort of Software Heritage and INRIA in two European projects, the FAIR Impact uh, project and in FAIR Core for EOSC. And so today, with, in this introduction to the webinar, I'm going to um, discuss why and, and how to make software a first class output. So first we will look at software as a pillar of open science. We'll discuss research software and define what is software and what is research software and how it is different from data. We'll see a few use cases where researchers um, need to um, work with research software. We will discuss archive reference versus citation, and we will f I will drop a line about the metadata, but just a very, a very short line because we I don't have too much time to discuss in depth the metadata. So now, why do we need to recognize software as a special research object? So first, from the data versus software article, we see that software is different from data because software is executable and is more similar to articles by being a creative work, while data is, same, is facts and observation. So yes, there is creativity in data, of course, and but software is written by humans for humans to read. Now, in the opportunity note from the French National Committee for Open Science, we see that it, we need to make sure the specific nature of software is recognized and not considered as just data. And this is just two examples that show why we need to acknowledge software as a research object different than data. Now, what is software? Most users look at software as magic because it think it's something that happens. It happens everywhere. It happens on your phone. It happens on your, on your computer. In research, you might use software and not know what's really happening behind it. But software is really the logic between what the human are capable to do with the software and the data. Now, there are two things that you need to keep in mind when you think of software. Software is a concept and a project that it can have a community around it working on this software. And so this part of the software is not digital. It is not a digital artifact and we do need to identify it. With that, there are the digital artifacts and there are a lot of digital artifacts. There are executables to use and there, are, there is the source code where you can really see the, um, uh, how the logic works. And in the source, it's a really large collection of digital artifacts. Now, why software source code is special? Well, because it is, well, it is complex. It has a large web of dependence. It can have a large web of dependencies. There are soft softwares that do not have a large uh, web of dependencies, but it's some, something that 
that is um, is um, is very um, uh, usual, uh, and it has a very normally a very complex um, history, which is the key to understand it. Now, some projects can last last decades, and as you can see on this map, uh, sometimes a project, a small project, is on which a, a large building is dependent on um, might disappear. So it's important to, to keep the software. Now, as I said, software source code is human readable and then it can be e executable knowledge. As Harold Ebelson said, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute because the, the view to the mind of the designer is in the source code. And this is something important. Even if you are not a software developer, you can read code. It might seem like poetry, very complex and un not understandable, but everyone, every, every person can, can read, read code. Now, we talked about software. What is software? What is research software? So recently with the Fair for Research Software Working Group, we had an output defining research software. Now in this definition, there was a separation between the research software, which is created during the research process or for a research purpose and software in research, which is used for research. Why we differentiate that is about, is um, for the next slides and also for the full webinar, DOIs and other uh, uh, very specific uh, identifier in academia will be given to uh, research software and not to software in research. Now, software is one of the pillars of open science. It is, uh, should be at the same level alongside publication with open access repository and data with open data set repositories. And a uh, um, specific thing about software, it has multiple facets. So as I said, it can be used in research as a tool. It can be the research outcome or the result of, of the research. And here is, it, this is the research software and it can be the object of research. And when it is the object of research, it is more as data, something to analyze, to work on. And the, th the thing is that software can be those three things at the same time for different teams. Now, as I started, we want to make software a first class output. And how do we do that? That's the challenge. We are not there yet. And here on the slide, we, you see the Nozek pyramid where we need to start from the bottom or from the top or from the middle, making software a first cloud output. I will start from the bottom by making it possible. So there are many initiatives and organizations that are working to make this a reality. We have the Fair Call for EOS project creating connectors and APIs between the uh, dif with different um, existing infrastructures. Um, and there are other uh, infrastructure that I'm not going to detail here in this presentation, but you're welcome to look at the Fair Call for Yours project and the CIRS report. Then there is making it easy by giving researchers and other stakeholders um, ways to do it e more easily. We have the code meta vocabulary, which I will discuss later on, and you have the citation file format, which is um, making it easy for researchers to cite software or to make their software citable. Then you have communities and this, and this part, which is important is making it normative. So you have also effort making it normative. Uh, mo last, not last, you have the incentives because we need to make it rewarding. So credit is a part of that. We had the 411 uh, citation working room and the 411 software site implement software citation implementation working with a very long name. And there are different ways to make it um, rewarding by providing awards. Here it's in French, it's the, pri it's the award for uh, open source software in open science, which will be uh, also this year in November. And finally, you have policies that needs to be in place to make software first class output. And you have 
RISA, which is working behind the Adore software um, uh, document. And there's the French National Plan for Open Science, which is a policy to uh, keep in mind. And I've only put the INRI institution, but each institution can have a policy to um, uh, improve the software place in, in the scholarly ecosystem. And so why are we here? And here I'm going to, to just uh, touch a little bit the use cases that we have around. We have some use cases for researchers about archival and reference and finding useful software, getting credit, verifying, reproducing results. Then we have the laboratories and teams tracking the software contribution or producing reports. And maybe those teams have web pages to maintain with these software outputs. And there's the organization, so the institution with knowing which are the software assets they are holding. And finally, but not least, there are the curators that need to verify and curate software metadata and provide some documentation and monitor research teams production. Now, what is at stake? This is taken directly from the SEERS report. So I don't, I'm not going to take time discussing what is the SEERS report. It is scholarly infrastructure for research software, providing recommendation for the infrastructure, again, making it possible. And here we need to archive to make sure we can access the software reference to make sure we can identify the artifacts, the digital ones. We need to cite for credit to make it rewarding to create software by giving by giving credit, but having citation, maybe citing the project and not the artifact, not only the artifacts. And then finally, the describe, which make it easy to discover the software project, so for findability. Now. Why archiving? Why archive is the first one and is so important because software source code is fragile. It can be lost, it can be forgotten, it can not work anymore. So it is fragile. And we have the software heritage team, we have the software heritage archive, which is identified in the Sears report as the universal source code archive. Now, it is also catering the scholarly ecosystem, but it's catering other ecosystems as well, like industry, public administration, and cultural heritage. In the scholarly ecosystem, we strive to connect with aggregators, publishers, and scholarly repositories, different, different infrastructures, so that we keep our software uh, in, saved. We save our software. So the uh, mission of this of software heritage, the archive is to collect, preserve and share all software source codes because preserving our heritage is enabling better software and better research for all. By having the software, having it, we know that we can have better research. Now, it is very easy to say with software heritage. So this is my two, my one slide about um, why to use and how to use uh, software heritage, you can save any code now, like the Wayback Machine on archive.org. You don't need to be the copyright holder of the software and it's for public software. So something that's online with your URL, it will save all the development history um, and it can, uh, um, we can um, um, collect anything from Git, SVN, Mercurial, different types of origins. And then you can um, you can reference this code, this artifact, the digital artifact. Not talking about citation yet. Um, by going on the source code on the archive, choosing the directory because this is the best one to choose. Then uh, adding the context because it's important to have the context of this artifact. And finally, copying the identifier. That's that's a short how to use software heritage and why to use the hash ID, the software heritage ID, it's because it's identifying the specific artifact. It's like a fingerprint. It's intrinsic, um, it's decentralized, and it's cryptographically strong. Now, it's not enough when you come to citation, because we have ne very different levels of granularity. We talked in the beginning that there's the part where we have the project that we want to identify and we, are, we have the part where we want to identify the artifacts. So in this pyramid, you see the different level of granularity. Again, I'm not going to um, um, specify each one of these levels, but you can understand that 
one project can have many files. And if you want to identify a specific algorithm, which is a code fragment, that's another thing than identifying the full project. So we need to, to know that there are different levels of granularity and different type of identifiers can help us identify those uh, levels of granularity. For the use case, the reference or citation use case, we have, um, we have the possibility to use two different uh, identifiers. So we have here in this diagram, I'm using the HAL ID be because the diagram shows the interaction between Software Heritage and HAL, the French National Archive. But in the next slide, I will show you the same thing with a DOI. So not a, the same diagram, but the same concept, having two identifiers for the same citation. Why? Because the um, the DOI or the extrinsic identifier is for credit and attribution. It will identify the metadata record with the authors and contributors, while the uh, SWID is an intrinsic identifier will help us identify the specific artifact that we want to identify. And for different purposes, for archival and index, we need both. For credit, we need the extrinsic identifier. And for reuse and reproducibility, we will need really just the specific artifact without the extrinsic ones. So now the case of the DOI and the Swede on IPOL articles is very nice because on the, well, IPOL, for those of you who just discovered this um, new acronym, Image Processing Online is, um, uh, is a journal where the um, researchers need to submit an article with the software, with a, with a, something that's working and online, there will be a demo of this uh, source code. The source code is deposited to the, to the journal and it then is archived in Software Heritage. And at the end, you have the citation of the, the article and the citation of the software. I'm going to show you how it works. So this um, researcher will submit uh, to the um, to the journal the all the artifacts which will be reviewed by a committee or peer reviewed the editor and have some interaction about that and when it's validated it will be saved on the platform of uh, the journal and then in uh, software heritage as well now a short word about the citation in this um, is that you can use also the Bibliotech extension to cite different levels of granularity. In this uh, Bibliotech style, there are just four um, four types: software, soft. Well, it's not on the slide, but it's software, software module. Here, software release, which is the version, and then the software expert excerpt which is the code fragment and there's a youtube tutorial to show you all these uh, possibilities while you can use that of course with a doi just didn't have an example to show on the slide but again we have the two the two the mechanism citing both a swede and a doi and an extrinsic identifier and so a touch about the metadata as you've seen on my background this is the image i'm using metadata is very important because the the identifier the extrinsic identifier will identify the metadata record so it's important that to note that researchers should know more about metadata should provide metadata they should provide metadata in the code itself and on a registry or a scholarly repository so that the software can be understood and found. And we have now a, an effort with the Fair Impact Project about the research software metadata guidelines, which I call with a, with a new acronym, RSMD. Uh, it's now open for the community review until May 29th. If you are interested, this, is, this will uh, pave the way to make it, uh, make it normative again from our uh, first slide and just to finish this is uh, one of my last the in a minute i will finish in a second i will finish just to let you know about the code meta initiative if you haven't heard about that the code meta initiative well it's a vocabulary but it's more than that it's also a full community um the vocabulary is a subset of schema.org to make it um uh, well 
for web semantic purposes. But the most important aspect of code meta is its crosswalk table mapping the metadata landscape. So there are many mappings with different vocabularies, including CFF. And uh, version three of the code meta vocabulary is expected soon. So there are different ways to capture metadata, different vocabularies, but everything, some of them, most of them, maybe not most, but <laughs> a good part is mapped to code meta through the code meta project. And now to wrap up, what's important to keep from my presentation is that we want to make software uh, first class output and for to, and to do that we need to archive the code we need to adopt good practices to reference and cite research software and it will be nice if you join the research software community and reviewing the rsmd guidelines but just joining the conversation about research software and spreading the word to to begin to recognize software in academia thank you for having me and thank you for uh, staying tuned for the next presentations. Thanks a lot, Moran. And now I'm going to share my screen. And sorry. I'm, uh, I again, I'm Gabi Mejias, uh, Community and Program Manager at Datasite, and I'm going to um, speak about how Datasite supports uh, visibility, connectivity, and citability for research software. And um, before a short introduction, uh, for those of you who might be new to Datasite, we are a global uh, nonprofit organization. Um, we have currently uh, more than um, 280 members across 50 countries. Uh, we are a membership organization sustained and governed by uh, different um, institutions around the world. From these 280 uh, members, 56 are consortia. These are a group of five or more organizations that join data site to um, adopt our um, DOIs and metadata infrastructure in a local, uh, national, or uh, regional level. And uh, overall, more than uh, 1,200 organizations have connected uh, more than 2,700 repositories. Um, overall, um, there are currently 42 million a uh, little bit more uh, DOIs in our registry. And um, we want to um, uh, help um, uh, increase uh, recognition and connectivity for research outputs and resources. And um, we provide DOI and metadata registration. Um, the data site metadata schema is a list of um, metadata properties that enable accurate and consistent identification of uh, resources uh, for citation and other um, purposes. Important to say that our metadata uh, schema is an international globally adopted standard. Um, it's governed by the community through the data site metadata working group that maintains this standard um, in consultation with our members and uh, with our board. And uh, currently, um, the most current version is 4.4. Uh, and you can see um, the, the schema can be uh, divided into three uh, uh, groups. Um, we have the mandatory um, properties, the recommended, and the optional properties. So as part of the mandatory um, properties, uh, we have uh, five. Uh, including creator, title, publisher, uh, publication year, and resource type. And currently, our schema supports more than 20 different resource types. Um, software is one of them. And as Moran said, we want to make uh, software and other kind of uh, outputs and resources uh, first class uh, citizens uh, within the research landscape. Um, someone asked, in the Q&A about Jupyter 
notebooks and you can see also we have computational notebooks as a different um, kind of uh, resource and also important to mention that uh, metadata completeness is very important to us so we encourage all our members to um, register as much uh, metadata and as curated as possible and um, also to mention that um, citations and references can be created by adding um, related identifiers to um, DOI metadata. So each related identifier uh, has a relation type, which is used to define uh, the type of relations. And um, you can add citations and references to DOI metadata uh, when you first register the DOI uh, and also afterwards um, through updates on the metadata. And um, we define uh, citations as incoming uh, pointers to a research output and uh, references as outgoing pointers to other research outputs and um, important also to mention that we encourage the same relation types for software citation as for data citation. And um, research is intrinsically interconnected and metadata uh, helps make those connections uh, visible and transparent. And the data side metadata schema um, includes properties that facilitate these connections between works and other type of entities, such as individuals, uh, organizations, and other kind of works. And um, these uh, relations um, in the metadata schema uh, include uh, other uh, many types of uh, persistent identifiers um, that um, help realize the, the pit graph. And here you can see a snapshot of March uh, 22. So currently there's uh, more um, nodes um, added. Uh, and you can see, um, yeah, software uh, being one of the nodes and uh, all the connections to different kind of entities. And here you can see an example of the metadata for software that you can register um, using um, DOI metadata. And you can see the resource type um, software. It has a, a relation or actually two. It's a new version of and a DOI and it's a version of and another DOI, the description. And this is um, some of the, of the metadata you can register. And to give you an overview of the current adoption of um, DOIs for software, um, some um, statistics from our registry. So I said before, we have currently more than 42 million DOIs um, registered overall. And here you have the top 10 resource types. So you see data set East. Um, the most common, uh, currently 14 million um, DOIs for data sets, followed by text, physical object, images, other uh, preprint collection, journal articles, and software is on the ninth place. There are almost 400,000 um, software resource types in the registry, and the 10th being audiovisual. And um, to take a look at who's uh, registering DOIs for software, um, you can see the top 10 repositories. You can see Senodo uh, being um, the repository that registers uh, the highest amount, almost, um, yeah, uh, all the, the software items with 345,000 um, DOIs uh, registered. And it's great to have Lars on the call um, on, the, on the webinar. Uh, and hear his presentation later on, um, followed by other organizations. Uh, something interesting, interesting on this list is um, uh, Humanum, uh, which is uh, an infrastructure for uh, humanities. Um, and also to take a look at 
uh, the evolution of um, DOI registration uh, for software. Uh, we can see the progress uh, in the last nine years. Um, so uh, you can see here, there's a big leap between 2016 and 2017, and also between 2020 and 2021. Last year, we had almost 100,000 um, new um, software resource types in the registry. And um, so far, we are almost at the half of um, the registrations from last year. And uh, now let me tell you how we uh, support increasing the uh, visibility of research uh, software. Um, so this is a snapshot of data site commons, um, which is a um, user interface that allows uh, search and um, discovery of all the information we hold um, in the registry, all the metadata. So this is an example of a software uh, resource type. Uh, it's identified with its DOI, uh, comes from uh, Zenodo, and you can see the um, uh, description um, of that item. And uh, you can see also the license, uh, which is supported in the metadata. And uh, you can also see the creators. Uh, so as Moran said, um, credit uh, recognition are very important. So you can see all the individuals that contributed to that software and also uh, their affiliations. And very important that um, when you register uh, this kind of metadata, you can include uh, ORCID IDs for individuals, um, RAW IDs for uh, organizations and also other type of identifiers. And um, also, um, as I said before, um, the data site metadata allows you to register uh, relations to other kind of outputs and other kind of persistent identifiers. So this software item has been uh, cited um, once. Uh, here you can see one citation and has been cited in a journal article and um, you can also uh, see the information about the journal article and the publisher. And um, Dataside Commons also has uh, or offers um, uh, citation um, information in different uh, formats. Uh, you can also download the metadata and something interesting for software um, contributors or practitioners is that um, it's also possible to add this information, the metadata of this software to your ORCID record through this button. And that's also um, important to enable recognition for this kind of contribution. And um, to continue increasing uh, connectivity, uh, it's very important for um, software uh, metadata to be connected to um, other uh, outputs and other identifiers. Um, so we have 309,000 software um, resource types on the registry. From those, there are 363,000 um, that are connected to other identifiers through the related identifier um, property on the metadata. And here you can see the most common connections, um, so uh, DOIs and your ELs are the most uh, common. Missing um, means there's not a related uh, identifier, and um, you can see other kind of identifiers being used. I checked, and um, we do have some suite connected um, to um, uh, software DOIs through the URL field. And um, the, the ask um, would be to um, continue improving uh, discoverability and connectivity of software um, by uh, yeah, registering um, DOIs uh, for your software and uh, curating and enriching uh, the metadata 
uh, for example, using um, this uh, related identifier field. And it takes uh, a village um, to um, increase uh, visibility, connectivity uh, for uh, research software. DataSite uh, is currently involved in many different projects. Um, and uh, as Moran mentioned, uh, we are part of the FAIR Impact and uh, FAIR Core uh, for EOSC projects. Um, and um, on this project, uh, both uh, Software Heritage and uh, CERN are partners. Um, we are also part of the Make Data Count um, initiative. Uh, we've recently uh, announced um, the creation of a global uh, citation uh, corpus. And also uh, the FAIR Workflows project uh, is aiming um, to um, improve uh, software uh, recognition uh, as part of research workflows. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for your attention. And now I will give um, the word to Lars. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Uh, two seconds. There we go. Okay. So my name is uh, Lars Horn Nilsson. I'm uh, from CERN and I'm uh, leading the team responsible for Sano. So you have just heard that uh, research software is important part of research itself. You've seen multiple different uh, things that you can do. Okay, so the question is, of course, how, you know, how should you cite software? How would you cite software, and and what what can you do about it? Okay. Uh, and before I answer that questions, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the infrastructure behind all this software citation. Basically, if you have to do use an analogy, how how does the entire banking system look like? That actually accounts for all these uh, these citations and what are some of the challenges that are that are involved in it. So, uh, if you look at it at a very basic level, right, you have an, uh, a researcher as an author of a scholarly manuscript who is using some piece of software developed by another uh, researcher who wrote this piece, right? And the the basic idea of software citation is that. Um, that this token of credit, uh, uh, the citation itself, is given to the developer so they can uh, get the get the highest end. Right? It's basically the monetary uh, uh, unit here we have in, in research is is uh, citations. So how can we get it along? Okay, and if you look at it as a, as a big system, right? Then you have an author up in the left corner who writes a paper. He they uh, give it to a publisher who publishes the paper. It gets indexed by some sort of a discovery system. Um, and uh, that discovery system is able to count the citations, and you also have a developer who writes the software down in the in the bottom right, who, who publishes the software, and then somehow the discovery system can match this uh, paper and citation up and give uh, citation come back to the developer. Okay. So in this big picture, which I'll go into details with, right then. Um, there's basically two key systematic issues in it. There's a huge information loss, and there's a dilution of cit citations, uh, where these, these citations being diluted uh, along the, every single thing. And I'll go uh, a little bit in, in detail. So as an author, your main job is to include a citation in the paper, right? But then you have to figure out what do you cite? You know, do I cite a, a software paper? Do I cite the software itself, the software version? Uh, do I cite the software heritage ID? It might be your reference manager doesn't really uh, support dealing with a software type or can't generate properly uh, proper citation strings. So there's this problem like, well, I actually don't know which part to, to cite. So that's the, that's, uh, the first one. And here's an example of, of uh, how how this can look like. So there was a piece of software called triangle.py, that two DUIs in Sonoto, then it was renamed to corner.py, another three DUIs. Then there was a, a journal of open source software paper, and there was also another identifier in this astronomy source, source code library, right? So which one of these do you cite? Which which is it's which one do you put in the in the reference, right? 
that that's uh, that creates a messy world and it makes it hard for a discovery system to then figure out is this the entire is this all the same thing or is it not how do we count citations to this so then uh, let's next look at the at the publisher so if if the author manages to include the citation then the next thing is that uh, the publisher has to make sure that that citation is actually included in the final product so first of all those publishers might have uh, policies that prevent Software citations that you are not allowed to cite only papers, you cannot cite data and software. This has been changing and, and luckily it's, uh, it's, it's uh, getting accepted, but we're still not there. Then another important thing is that um, uh, it might be that the, the textual description, when, when you have a reference list, right, you have the citation string, that citation string needs to be passed by some sort of machine. And uh, if it has to be passed just from the text, it's very hard to, uh, to ensure you get the right DUIs out of it and things like that. So what a publisher has to do is to make sure that the DUI that was somehow in your reference manager makes it into the final product in some sort of machine readable way, which is, is uh, called uh, uh, publishers often use JetXML, right? And often uh, these final uh, systems, they need to be adapted. So, so when you publish in some sort of journal, then that journal might be owned by a scientific society who outsource the running of the journal to a publisher, who have outsourced the authoring platform to a vendor, who have outsourced the vendor, uh, vendor platform and the coding of the vendor platform to some other company. So if you need a change to enable proper the DUI to go all the way through to the discovery system, it can be quite daunting to actually make it through and get that change into an authoring system and make sure that it's communicated correctly. Okay, so that, that's uh, some of the challenges that are there. Now, uh, let's look at the, the discovery services themselves. So a discovery service basically has to take uh, a paper and inject it into their database and track citations to it. But first of all, then they need to allow that the software, uh, they need to be able to count citation to a piece of software and identifying the S list link, right? And um, it might be they don't allow software at all, right? But also just understanding when to create a new record, you saw all the different persistent identifiers that you could have, you know, is, is this all the same? How do we want to model it? So just understanding how to actually attribute the link from the paper to something and count all of the citation is, is a non-trivial thing for these, uh, these discovery systems. Um, on top of that, then for instance, uh, there's the Seaborn uh, uh, Python library for statistical data visualization. And each uh, the, the different discovery systems basically cover different spectrums uh, of uh, where they count citations. So for instance, your PMC uh, uh, looks at a certain subset of data and they count citations for another thing. For instance, NACE ADS, they look in astronomy and then uh, there's, there's data as well in Crossref about the Seaborn. And Seaborn is a, is a tool, a statistical data visualization. So you can imagine it can be used in many different sciences. So that also means that uh, these discovery services count citations in different areas. And in this case, only one citation was in all the different three, um, three discovery systems. So you need basically to have a global picture uh, of multiple systems to get a full citation count out of it. Now, uh, if we briefly look at the, um, the developer, then they basically need to ensure that their software is citable. Uh, and again, the problem comes in like, you know, do I write a software paper? Do I put the software on uh, Sonodo? Do I put it in software? What, what do I do? Uh, do I stick in the GitHub URL or, or things like that? But then there's also things like dynamic authorship. So software is often a collaboration where there's many people coming and going and, and making sure that you know who, who should get created if you just put it in in the, in the DUI initially then how can you see uh, that the new contributors that came in and how do they get uh, created for, for being part of it right um, and then of course people can have good ideas of changing names because it's not uh, a good enough name and things like that that all complicates how we are able to count and track citations uh, to software um, Another example is that then because of all these different persistent identifiers, then essentially citations will be spread over all the different uh, identifiers. 
And here's an example of, uh, of a piece of software where two different DOIs were recommended in the, in the actual BibTeX uh, copy paste uh, link, which means you get citations on both of them. Another example is what the, um, uh, what Gus Monkey calls BibTeX latency. Uh, so here, essentially, people will take a reference to uh, to uh, take a software citation, take that reference, put it in the uh, reference manager, and then they will reuse it through time and only later on uh, pick up a new one. So what you see is that it takes time for new DUIs to to do. So overall, if we want to count uh, software citations. Uh, it, it gets somewhat complicated to, to really cover the, the full ground, right? So overall, there's just um, systemic issues all over the place here, uh, information loss, uh, and that you dilute the, the citation over, over lots of different persistent identifiers. So uh, back to my initial question, now that I've demotivated everybody, <laughs> uh, about that, that it, there's no point in citing software. So how, how should you cite software, right? And I think if there's just one thing I want you to take back with you from today is that you should just choose one of the things that you hear in one of the presentations today and do it, okay? We as infrastructure providers are all working on solutions to most of these problems that I've shown you, okay? Uh, what you can do as a research software developer or uh, paper as, as an author of a paper right is to just choose one of the things and and do it and that will help move the system along everybody this is a huge chain link system and if we don't all uh, improve then the entire system doesn't improve okay so each one of you has to choose just one thing and and do it that's my claim so what could you do now that uh, you've uh, you've chosen right, so uh, simple things is you know ask uh, if you have research software developers ask your users to cite. You can archive your software in a repository, for instance, Zenodo and Software Heritage. You saw different solutions. Choose one that that fits you the best. Okay, uh, you could write a, 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 a an article in this journal of open source software, which is really about like, how do you also make the software reusable for somebody else and describes it in a, in a nice way, right? Um, so um, how? Well, uh, an easy way is uh, if you're using GitHub, for instance, or any kind of uh, tool, then you can add this citation.csf file inside your repository. If you do that on GitHub, they will add this nice uh, cite this repository that will highlight users uh, that they can cite it, okay? And the uh, important thing is that it also, this, this file, as with the code meta file that the Morin was describing, puts in some metadata in the source code that we can use to figure out who should actually be the authors of uh, this piece of software, who should get credit, and what do you want to call it? And it uh, allows us to get this metadata out of it. And anybody who gets the software can get that metadata out of it, okay? And that's important in order to be able to, to check. Then uh, archive in a repository. So uh, Sonodo, as you saw, is uh, have had great success with with uh, with our GitHub integration, where essentially you you go uh, flip this, you go log in with your GitHub account on Sonodo, you flip a switch, and then uh, every time you create a release uh, of your software in uh, uh, on GitHub. We get notified, and we will then uh, pull it down, uh, stick it in in Sonodo, and give it a DOI. Okay, and if you have this citation CFF file, then we automatically we, we use that to basically uh, add the metadata into the into the software. Now, if you've used Sonodo and uh, and uh, put your software there, then what we do is that we will scout uh, currently three different discovery systems for citations to your to your uh, to your software, and we will aggregate it all. So that means that even if you have multiple versions of a piece of software. And then we'll be able to show all the citations that links to all this uh, all this software. So, for instance, here you see it's a Matplotlib that then have uh, seventy six uh, citations to to it from different places. Okay, and it, this is solving part of this issue with the multiple different persistent identifiers that I, I was talking about before. So, my last word is basically: remember, choose one thing. It doesn't have to be any of the one I presented here. Anything from the presentation and do it. Okay. Here is some of the recommendations I can give. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Hello. Lars. And now we'll hear from Stefan. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that Paul was meaning to uh, share a poll. Um, but first, let me introduce myself. I'm Stefan Driskat. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Software Technology at the German Aerospace Center. And I will um, highlight a very practical point of view on the topic of um, using DOIs for your software, citing software, publishing software. And the thing I'm going to introduce is a project called Hermes. I'm just going to start sharing my slides. And what we're trying to do in this project is take the idea of the GitHub Zenodo integration that Lars has just talked about one step further. Lars has described that um, Zenodo will pull metadata from a citation.cff file from a repository whenever you have it switched on. Um, and there is a lot of metadata present in the source code repository, even beyond a CFF file. And this is metadata that we can use to, um, to make the software more findable, more accessible, more understandable. So while you fill in the poll, and this is gonna be very interesting uh, to me because um, uh, I will talk about some of the platforms you can use for automated software publication. And I'm very interested in seeing what actual solutions you use. I will um, continue with my presentation in the meantime. So I'm briefly going to talk about uh, why you should think about publishing your software in the first place. I think we've heard some great uh, comments and great uh, remarks on why you should do this already. I'm going to add to this. And then I'm going to introduce um, the Hermes automated software publication workflow and also um, give you a brief demo of our proof of concept implementation of the workflow because what can possibly go wrong demoing live in front of 220 people online right and finally i'll i'll, I'll, I'll share with you what the plans are for the future so what do we actually mean when we talk about software publication um you should publish your software for at least these four very good reasons. Um, software publication, so making your software available to the public under a DOI or other persistent identifier, enables at least these four things. Um, it enables making your software fair, so making it findable, accessible, uh, interoperable to some extent, and reusable. Because if you don't publish software, then nobody will know about it. Um, software publication, at least in the way we define it, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, um, enables the technical sustainability, at least, of the software, meaning that it will be available in the future and be adoptable to other needs than the original needs um, in the context of which the software has been created. And this makes it more sustainable. So archive your software. And we've heard some things about uh, receiving credit for your software work. And um, software publication under a DOI, if you supply a list of uh, personal author names, at least, uh, does enable academic credit for the people who created the software. And Moran was talking about um, the, uh, within the context of the pyramid in her talk about uh, incentives. And in this context, it may be interesting for you to hear that in Germany, the Helmholtz Association of uh, Research Centers has introduced um, a KPI, a key performance indicator um, around software publications. So starting this year, the um, centers within the Helm Association can leverage this indicator and start counting software publications that are citable and are published with metadata. And finally, um, software publication, especially if you make software versions citable that people actually use, enables reproducibility. Taking, again, one step back, what do we actually uh, mean in the context of the Hermes project when we talk about software publication? This is something that you've heard uh, something about already. Um, it's mainly the publication of metadata and artifacts for software versions and publication repositories. And the probably the most well-known um, publication repository is Zenodo that Lars has just talked about. Um, why is there an asterisk behind artifacts? Because um, you can also not with Zenodo, but with some other platforms, um, 
only publish the metadata for your software. And this, this is a good way to make your software fair, um, although it may be closed source. And we know that some, some research uh, software is closed source for, for reasons um, that uh, lie, lie within the project context. When you publish your software, you get a persistent identifier, a DOI, for each version. That's, this is very important, so people can actually uh, cite the version they have used in their research. And it's important to, and I think I digress a bit from what Lars has said here, um, as a, the Harness Project, we don't think that the following are actually so software publications. Um, software available on a source code platform, GitHub or GitLab, for example, is not a software publication. Um, a paper about the software is not a software publication because it's simply a different artifact. It's a piece of text rather than a software itself. Um, we have already heard also about uh, the Journal of Open Source Software. This is a software journal where you can um, submit a specific version of your software and write a bit of a text around it, a short, short paper around it. Um, this is a very good interim solution um, on the way to actual software publications where you publish the software itself and it doesn't need um, some sort of uh, it's kind of cover up paper um, to make it understandable to people uh, that this is an actual research output. So the idea is that you publish the software itself, you describe it with metadata to make it fair um, and people then cite the software version they're using or cite the software concept if that's what they need in their specific use case. The challenge obviously here is that uh, the usual quality assurance you get with publications in terms of peer review is not something that works um, well at the moment because there is no automated peer review if you push your, uh, if you push your code to, to Zenodo or to another platform. Uh, this is something that needs to be solved either in the software projects uh, themselves by employing code reviews on uh, integrations on new code that's coming into the project. Um, but also the software journals, especially JAWS, make a very good job of um, doing some, some peer review, some quality assurance, specifically around the software engineering uh, factors of, of the software. Right. So in Hermes, we are concerned with um, publishing your software in an automated, automated way um, with as rich metadata as possible, um, because we believe that there is... Um, a lot of metadata that can be reused for making your software uh, fairer and uh, metadata rich already. And we've already seen that if you want to not be bothered by filling in form with filling in forms uh, on the on the internet, um, typing in metadata um, in, into into a form for your publication, then you can already leverage um, the GitHub Zenodo integration especially if you have a citation file format file, citation.cff, this will improve the metadata already and you don't have to bother with um, manually publishing your software every time you make a release. So like I said, we're trying to take this one step further um, and automate this publication process via continuous integration platforms. And this we think has different advantages. First of all, we uh, turn the process of publication on its head. Lars has mentioned that uh, Zenodo pulls information from the uh, repository, from the GitHub repository, if you switch on the GitHub Zenodo integration. And this is great. And if you have a C CFF file, then that's great as well. But not all um, projects are on GitHub and not all projects um, have CFF files. And also Zenodo um, cannot possibly um, catch all the metadata that may be available in the source code repository. So we take uh, an approach of pushing, um, making, making the user push um, a publication to a publication platform rather than having the platform pull this information. And the way we do this, or the way we think about this is this uh, relatively complex looking concept. It's not really complex, in fact. Um, it's something that some of you who are software creators and work with continuous integration platforms will know. So the idea is that a user, an RSC, a research software engineer, pushes the version of the software they want to publish to a source code repository. Um, and within the source code repository, there is a continuous integration solution. So obviously a pipeline that runs whenever new code comes into the repository um, based on a trigger you can define. So for example, if you make a new release, or if you tag a specific version um, of your software. And this CI CD solution will then 
um, run the, a tool we're developing, which is the Hermes workflow um, a publication workflow tool. And what the tool does is it, it, it collects metadata from different sources. So we have metadata files such as code meta.json or citation.cff. It also um, collects metadata from code files. There is metadata, for example, in license headers, in, uh, in doc strings, in, in API um, descriptions, in, in comments, etc. Um, but also, uh, it's possible to to find metadata in documentation files, for for example, um, free text citation information, things like that. Um, and interestingly, there is metadata also. Uh, in different platform APIs or on, on different platforms, such as um, static code analysis platforms that you may use in your project, which may have interesting metadata regarding the software quality, for example, or um, actually the, the Git API, the, the Git history of the uh, source code repository platform itself. So all these metadata is being collected um, by the Hermes tool and then is proposed for, for uh, publication because in reality, in some of our projects and some of the projects we know we've been involved with, you have to have your line manager sign off on publications. And therefore, it's important that you are presented with the with this collected metadata, compiled metadata, and are able to and either send it on to someone who can sign off on the metadata and the publication itself, or you can do this yourself. And finally, then, if the metadata looks okay, it is published to the publication repository. So, like I said, um, one of the main aspects is that we are proactive, proactively pushing um, versions for publication rather than relying on the publication target platform to pull. Um, one big advantage of this solution is that it can support different platform combinations. So if you're if you if you if you host your code on GitLab, for example, on your institutional GitLab instance, and you want to publish on a Dataverse instance or a DSpace instance or your, your uh, institutional repository, this is something that Hermes supports. And we also support, um, as mentioned earlier, the curation um, process. So you can have a look at what you're actually publishing before it gets published, um, but also the fair publication of metadata only software publications in the in the case of closed source software. Uh, we've written a concept paper. There are many details, many more details in the paper itself. Um, the link to the slide, to these slides is in the chat already. And you can have a look at the paper if you're interested to learn more in detail. Um, we are now at a stage where we have a proof of concept implementation of this workflow in place. Um, the Hermes process uh, work, workflow tool uh, basically consists of five steps. Um, and they're being, um, they're being executed in this order. So first of all, you have a harvest step, which takes a look at your repository and harvests all the metadata um, available in the repository into a common data model. And then it does a bit of processing, which is mainly to collate the metadata, to look for duplications, to look for uh, conflicts you may have, for example, between different spellings of author names, different versions from different metadata sources. So you have, may have a version in the Git tag, you may have a version in the CFF file, different version, and perhaps even a third version somewhere else. Um, and then you have a report that is being, or at least the, the compiled metadata uh, set is being um, fed back to the user for curation, for signing off, um, on the metadata, and then it is being deposited on the platform. And because at this point, we already have a signed off on um, consistent metadata set for your software, uh, you can also post process the metadata and, for example, feed it back into the repository to update your citation.cff file, to update your code meta file, or update any other metadata you would want to update. Um, specifically, every single step is extensible. Uh, this is important because we want to target different metadata sources, not just CFF and Code Meta and, and Git, uh, which are the ones that we have in place right now. You want to be able to um, implement different merging strategies for the metadata you have. So this is extensible as well via plugins. Um, the curation is very basic at the moment. I will show you in a minute. Um, uh, but you, so we are in the process of setting up um, a concept for developing a curation UI so that people uh, that are not familiar with um, code meta.json uh, metadata files can have a better way, a nicer way to, to work with the metadata and look at them and sign off on them. 
Um, and finally, obviously, depositing, um, we want to target different platforms. So there is an Invenio plugin at the moment, which targets uh, Zenodo, which can target different other Invenio RDM instances, but we're developing a Dataverse plugin as well, and you can plug in your own solutions there. And finally, post-processing, um, you can already feed back metadata into the CFF file um, and into the Hermes configuration itself, but this is something that's, that's a very important uh, concept to be able to uh, make this workable for your combination of platforms, which is kind of why I've asked these polling questions at the beginning. Just very briefly, um, the project is a collaborative project between three German research centers, all part of the Helmholtz Association. We're being funded by uh, an incubator project called the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration. And where we are now is that we have a proof of concept publication workflow tool. We will develop by the end of the project CI support for these three um, CI solutions. So GitHub Actions, GitLab CI, Jenkins, and that's just because we think um, these are the most commonly used ones. And we will support Invenio RDM-based platforms and Dataverse-based platforms because those are the ones that are being used in Helmholtz the most. But um, how does this actually look to you as a user, as a software creator? Uh, in practice, and I'm going to start the demo in just a second, um, what you do is you push to the repository, then the GitHub action, in this case, runs Hermes, the Hermes workflow tool, which harvests and processes metadata, uh, creates a pull request for you, and then you can create uh, curate the metadata within the pull request and then decide whether you want to close the pull request without further action, which will abort the publication process. For example, if you have faulty metadata in there, if something went wrong, then you can just um, close the pull request. If you want to accept the, the metadata that has been compiled, you can merge the pull request and Hermes will then run the publication, the depositing step, uh, which will give you a publication and also will run post-processing um, which will again then create a new pull request for you to to sign off to to uh, sign off on the changes that post processing will have made. Right, um, let's dive right in. Um, I have prepared a demo repository which has been set up to use Hermes and um, published to Zenodo Sandbox. This is a link to the tutorial, and I've actually add my own dog food and used this tutorial to set up the repository. So I'm going to. Um, quickly share a different window and you can now see the publication uh, the, the demo repository um, which is really really just a skeleton so you have a basic very basic readme file um, I can quickly show you the Hermes tunnel configuration file which is um, at this point kind of configures the different steps so we harvest metadata from git and the CFF file we want to deposit on an Invenio based platform and specifically the Zenodo sandbox. It's a bit bigger. And we want to do some post-processing because as we've heard, uh, Zenodo will give you a DOI for your um, version, but also for the concept. And so the next time you publish um, your software, you want to publish under that same concept DOI to uh, make sure that um, the version is uh, counted as um, um, belonging to the same software project. This is a very, very basic citation.cff file. It's a YAML file, which gives you some basic metadata. And I will now try the demo, for which I will just adapt um, the readme.nv file. I'm just deleting a blank line, and I will push straight to the main branch. And because we have, I have configured the Hermes workflow here in this uh, GitHub action file, which is still a bit long, but like I said, it's a proof of concept. We're going to wrap this a lot nicer so you can, um, so you can use this more easily. And we've configured this to run every time you push to the main branch. And so I will look, have a look at the CI pipeline. And you can see um, it has picked up my new commit and is now running the software publication step, which has just succeeded. And as you can see, it has created a new pull request um, for this specific commit. And this is now the curation step. So we're now going to look at the metadata that's been compiled um, and we'll then sign off on it. I'll, quick you, I'll quickly show you what's 
happened, uh, you now have a code meta.json file with the compiled metadata from different sources in your repository. Um, this is stuff um, uh, related to con contributors rather than authors. Um, it comes from the from the uh, Git um, from the Git metadata source. Um, there are different roles in Git for people that interact with the repository, and then there is more metadata coming in here from the CFF file. And so now I've looked at the at the metadata. I think it's looking fine, and I will continue to merge this pull request. And fingers crossed, the action won't run too long. And I will have a publication in a minute. So going back to the to the uh, CI overview, I can now see that because I have um, curated this uh, pull request, I've curated the metadata and I've merged it, so it's signed off signed off on it. Um, Hermes has now started uh, trying to publish the software, and this will run for a couple of seconds. Um, I can show you the details. It basically sets up the Hermes workflow in the continuous integration pipeline. And it will then... Maybe, Stefan, in the meantime, we can share the poll results. Oh, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. So Perfect. Maybe, um, maybe you can... Or I can, I can guide, guide through it. Um, oh, that's so... fine. I can, I can do it if, if, if yeah. you like. Yeah, go yes. ahead. It's interesting. So we have a relatively even split in terms of continuous integration solutions between using GitHub Actions and using GitLab CI. And then I think that's probably because a lot of institutions use GitLab uh, for software development. And then there are uh, there's around a third of the people who don't use continuous integration yet. Um, and this uh, with regards to repositories, um, it's interesting to see that. Um, according to the data site slides, um, Zenodo is obviously the, the most liked most liked publication target. And there are people that don't publish yet, and there is a relatively even split between different other solutions. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely keep these, these answers on. So in the, in the meantime, um, the, the, the action is run through, and we can have a look at the actual deposit step that the Hermes has run and see that there is now a published record on Zenodo. And this is basically uh, populated with metadata from the citation.cff file. So author information in this case, like I said, is a very, very short file if you have a new version. And also going back to the source code repository, there is now a new pull request, which gives you the post-processing results from Hermes. Um, and this is basically changing the Hermes configuration to include the Zenodo record ID, Zenodo sandbox record ID. So next time I publish um, a new a new version of my software, this is going under the same concept DOI. Right, quickly going back to my slides. So as you've seen, we are now ready for very cautious user testing. This is still proof of concept, so make sure that you read through the tutorial carefully if you want to try this out. It should work with Zenodo proper already. So you can actually, if you use GitHub and, and Zenodo, then you can do this. Um, we'll be finished with the project by the end of June and have the proof of concept implementation ready with more metadata sources. So um, harvesting from different other sources, we will provide templates, not just for GitHub um, actions, but also for different other continuous integration systems. We'll have documentation and training materials ready in the form of a Carpentries lesson. And then we're looking to collaborate further with different other uh, institutions and actors to support other publication repository solutions, such as MyCore, which is a, which is a project with the uh, Technical University in Braunschweig, and um, supposedly also um, support DSpace. We are looking into working with the Carpentries who are interested in using Hermes to um, publish some of their outputs. Um, and so they need a custom plugin for this. And we are definitely looking into improved metadata curation possibilities, potentially via a, a dedicated user interface, like a website where the metadata is being sent for curation. And we will do some pre preliminary work at DLR, but are also looking for collaboration partners in this respect. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A section. 
thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for the presentation and the demo. And also uh, thanks to Lars and Moran. And now we have some time for uh, Q&A. Um, maybe, Stefan, if you can stop sharing um, your screen. Thank you. And um, I can uh, quickly start because some people have um, asked questions about um, comments and how the search works and how to claim works to your um, ORCID record. So here you can see um, data site uh, comments. Uh, so uh, it's um, the URL is um, commons.datasite.org. And it's possible to search by works. Um, so this is connected with uh, DOIs, people through ORCID IDs, organization through raw IDs and through repositories. And this is connected to re 3 data. So I've entered um, COVID as the keyword and um, I can soft, um, filter by resource type. So I'm selecting um, software and um, I can, for example, select this one. And uh, here I um, come to the um, snapshot I shared on my slide and um, you can select add to your ORCID record and then this information, you need to authorize the connection and then um, this metadata will be added to your ORCID record. Um, so that's what I wanted to quickly share. And now let's go to um, the other questions. There's a question about uh, what are the biggest shortcomings that publishing platforms have? And if we're aware um, of plans to implement desirable practices in open publishing platforms, such as OJS or research um, equals, and um, I think, uh, Lars, you've spoken about um, this topic and obviously uh, Stefan as well. Um, so I don't know if you would like to um, answer this. Yes, so I'm not sure if it's only if it's really the publishing platforms like OJS or it's, it's in general, right? So I think there was also some questions a bit later down. I think each platform has different pros and cons, and there's not one size that really fits all. So you have to see where it fits in. It's also about what is your purpose of, of the, the software citation. This is for credit or reproducibility. And re it's like, there's not one size that fits all. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if that, that answers the question. <laughs> Thanks, and I don't know if uh, Stefan, um, you would like to add something. So, in terms of um, having a rich metadata set that's that's actually presented on publications uh, platforms, I think one of the shortcomings is that there isn't yet enough support for the software type in all of the platforms that are out there and are being used in in, in research and in academic institutions, and specifically. Uh, things like having versioning and having version DOIs um, is something that would be really good to have in more platforms and being able to, you know, push push metadata that's uh, software specific, such as license information, programming language, et cetera. Zenodo so does really support this in a, in a very nice way. And so the, I guess this is one of the reasons why we see so many software pub publications on Zenodo rather than, than other platforms. Thank you. And uh, another question, what would be good sources for discovery tool managers to activate to help make archive software more visible? Um, Moran, I don't know if you'd like to uh, say something about this. Uh, thanks, Gabby, for giving me the, the question, even though I'm not sure how we can help uh, with that yet with software heritage. We are, we are indexing the metadata, but not yet providing tools to for discovery. The discovery is done with registries and on, on data site, for example, or on other aggregators. Um, so it's, it, 
th this question specifically is more for you, Gabby. Um, I, I wanted to say just a short thing about publishing because of the last question. We need to really uh, divide publishing like an article, like on, on Dross or on other platforms that are publisher where there is a code review and, a, and an article review of the research output and sharing the code. Sharing the code is possible in the it's self-archive. It is better because then it is findable because in order also you have uh, discovery tools in terms of uh, it's, it's indexed and you can find the software is easy, easily it's better with Zenodo than in with software heritage for findability purposes, but it's still just sharing and self archiving and not publishing in terms of having people looking into the into the um, artifacts and reviewing reviewing the software. So we need to really differentiate these two um, use cases. Thank you and. Coming back to the questions um, or to the question for discovery to managers, um, and we have uh, Christian Garza, um, who is our product design manager. Uh, Christian, I don't know if you have any recommendations uh, for discovery tool managers to help make archive software more visible. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, but actually, I don't. I mean, do you think of something, Stefan? That it could be? I have Stefan in front of me. Sorry, I'm taking that one. That just... it's, it's definitely a tricky one. Um, so from my context, speaking from my perspective, it would it would have to be a, a solution around metadata and um, you know, considering um, a set of very basic metadata that can be then um, reused to identify the the output itself, maybe. But I don't have any ready-made solutions. Uh, it's a tricky one. Thank you, and we can um, continue um, discussing this. Uh, we have a notepad available, so for the questions that we won't be able to answer live will um, share some comments on the on the notepad on the chat box thanks paul and a question um for lars what is the actual status of the gitlab senodo integration yeah i wanted to type the answer and then i clicked the wrong button so and then i couldn't come back first uh so the um, uh, there's currently no no assigned effort to do it okay so there's um in Helmholtz, they have a GitLab integration on a Vino RDM. It's something we're looking at, but the, the, the big thing for Sonoro right now is that in September, we will be doing a large upgrade, uh, which will add a lot of features into communities and things like that. So that, that's the, the main focus right now. So nothing concrete. Um, thank you. And then there were some um, questions about the polling itself, but um, Stefan already shared the results. But there's another question for Stefan about Helmholtz uh, KPI for software publications. How are um, you counting published software per package, per version? Do you consider number of citations for the software package and any other information you can share? Yes, um, I will look up the link and share the link to the uh, Helmholtz Open Science Policy, which details that um, in, in a second. But just um, very basically, so the, the first iteration of this, um, of this uh, uh, um, KPI, so to speak, is, is looking at just published software versions that are citable and have a DOI and it's, you know, relatively decent metadata attached. So it's really just counting beans at this stage. But they're in the process of developing um, um, a, a KPI that will also look at quality. And to me, it's um, not quite clear what this will end up being. Um, it's definitely a very hard question to answer, how to you know, automatically uh, define the quality of a software, because there are so many levels with regard to that. You have the software engineering quality, you know, test coverage, um, that kind of thing. But that's all also things that can be can be uh, gamed, and then you have different 
quality. So is, is the algorithm that the software implements correct, for example? Is it, the, is it, is it um, sufficiently fast to execute on an HPC platform, for example? So this is going to be a very interesting discussion to have in the future, how, this, how a better um, indicator will look like. Thanks, uh, Stefan. And there's um, a comment uh, from um, Vim Ugo. Um, if we treat software repository uh, the same way as we do with data, we should make a distinction between a repository of records, such as an auto, where the main objective is citation and dissemination use cases and long term preservation of the same object or artifact. Software heritage happens to satisfy satisfy both use cases, but if the publication copy is in a repository that does not explicitly offer long-term preservation, which includes aspects of sustainability, funding, etc., we should also put a copy into software heritage and link that PID as the long-term preservation object. Um, so I don't know if uh, any I can, is yeah. yeah. I can, uh, well, it's not a question, it's a, it's a comment, but I will answer it with the FAIR core for EOS project, which uh, we are working on these connectors between the different infrastructures so that the artifacts that are deposited or submitted in, an, in a scholarly infrastructure will be then also transferred for long-term preservation in software heritage. And also Lars has answered one of the other question in the answered uh, section, that this is something that we are working with CERN and with Dance and with also publisher like Daxtool and uh, Episciences and with aggregators with you data site um, and uh, with SW Math and finally also with Open Air. So the, it's very important for interoperability that all these infrastructure can uh, relay the, the, the metadata and the information between on research software and also um, keep the artifacts in a in a way that it's preserved for the long term. So yes, there is we're all working on on that. Great, thank you so much. And um, the time's running up, so we don't have any uh, more time to answer questions. But we'll continue answering those on the notepad. Thanks um, all for joining us today, and special thanks to um, Lars, uh, Stefan, and Moran for your presentations and demos and for contributing to this discussion. Uh, as I said before, we'll share the recording and the slides per email. And we also have two um, webinars uh, coming up in June uh, featuring uh, the Global Access Program and how um, we're going to um, work um, with partners from Africa and Latin America. Uh, you can see the registration links on the chat. Um, so thank you all for joining us today and see you next time.